Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital. Thank you so much for joining us on another Tuesday afternoon Barometer Readings webcast. An important one today, especially given the volatility as of late in the market. Uh, we are going to address that head on. And uh, as always, joining me in conversation is our Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer, David Burroughs. Uh, if you have questions, which I'm sure you do, uh, please don't hesitate to ask us those uh, on the Q&A or chat via Zoom, or of course, you can email me at any time during the course of this conversation, phastings at barometercapital.ca. And uh, with that, I will turn the conversation over to David. I know he's got a full presentation to deliver. So Dave, good afternoon. Thanks so much for taking mm -hmm. the time. Hey, Pam, and I want to thank everybody for taking the time to log on today. The, you know, it's interesting. Uh, in February of 2020, when COVID hit, we started doing these weekly webcasts. And at the time, <clears throat> I really had no idea it was something that we would continue to do weekly from then until now. And, and I frankly don't think that we will ever stop because it gives us a forum once a week to sort of address what's going on in the market, uh, weigh the odds, uh, address uh, portfolio construction as it relates to what's going on, uh, and hopefully answer a lot of questions proactively. But of course, you can never answer all of them. And so we always look look forward to the opportunity to having one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, with clients or prospective clients <clears throat> to answer any further questions. Um, there's no shortage of questions out there. Uh, we have been now for some time dealing with uh, the inflation that came along with the reopening of the economy. Uh, we've dealt with the conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, we've dealt with the shutdown policy in China and what that's done to global supply chains. Uh, and of course, over the last number of months, we've dealt with a very <clears throat> vociferous and hawkish Federal Reserve Board uh, and the interest rate uh, uh, process that they've gone on uh, to try and uh, haul back the impacts of inflation. And the market's wrestling with all of that. Uh, we've had a regime change in interest rates uh, in the bond market. Uh, and uh, certainly it's, it's caused uh, problems in some, some countries where they have uh, a more difficult uh, fiscal and, and monetary situation. <clears throat> and all of it goes into a cocktail to generate uh, performance in the market. And, and you know one of the obvious questions that we get is should I be you know, 100% in cash, should I just go to the sidelines and wait it out, uh, which is sort of a binary, binary discussion. Because frankly, the two things that you have to do if you do that is one, choose the moment to leave, and then figure out exactly the right moment to come back, uh, which I can assure you, I don't think I've ever seen happen once. <clears throat> and so we have worked on uh, talking about the step by step process we've been going through and really trying to tailor the assets that we own to the market that we're in. So what I wanna do quickly is just run through uh, where we are from a big picture, our assessment of the situation. There are no shortage of people with opinions. Uh, Jamie Dino, Diamond put his opinions out there today and, and there's no question, he's a, a very smart guy. He runs probably the most conservative bank in the US and he's very good on the economy. The question is whether he's right on market timing. Uh, there's also some other very smart people with other opinions, uh, and uh, we try to assimilate really what's going on out there to, to, to factor uh, how it is that we should structure portfolios across different asset classes, including cash, uh, to, to, to weather the storm that we're in right now. So um, just, just let me just start from the top. You know, we continue to believe that we are in a structural bull market that started in 2013 for equities. Um, there are certainly lots of people who are questioning that. These are the type of bear markets that you have in a structural bear market, you know, like 2000 through 2003 or 2008, nine, which are, you know, very large super bear markets, sort of 45% declines, happened back in 1973, 74 in that structural bear market. Notice they don't tend to happen right at the beginning of a, a new bear market. Uh, they tend to happen sort of midway through. And not to say there aren't significant pullbacks along the way in structural bull markets, but they tend to be more like 18 to 25%, which is sort of what we've been dealing with to this point. Um, but we'll certainly assess that as we go along. <clears throat> if we look at the S&P, this is the S&P as we sit right now. We've talked over the last number of 
webcasts, that it tends to be that the lower bound of a structural bull market is a rising 200 week moving average. And you very often pull back and touch those, but as was the case in 2002, when you eventually breach the 200 week moving average, that may mean that we're in a different situation. So same way since the beginning of the bull market in 2013, these are weekly bar, monthly bars. We breached briefly the 200 week moving average uh, in the worst part of the COVID sell-off, which in fact was the fastest bear market in history, happened over two months. But by the time the second month closed, we were actually back above it and have remained above it since. If we look at it another way and look at the spider or the proxy, the ETF for the S&P 500, we know that it's been in this channel all the way along and there have been pullbacks and they're painful, but they're over fairly quickly. And so the question is, here we are sort of lying in the sand, where do we go from here? It's important to remember what the makeup of the S&P 500 is. We've had one of the greatest bull markets in technology in history. And as a result, a lot of the biggest companies are technology companies. And certainly technology is under pressure. I think when Jamie Dimon says the index could go down this much, he's keeping in mind what the index is made up of. What things are very large in the index, which may be weak, and what things are maybe small within the index that are relatively strong. And we've always said, we don't want to be invested like the index. You don't need to pay us for that. Our job is to target strong assets and avoid weak ones. And so if big parts of the index are weak. We probably want to be careful with the index itself, which is why we're very targeted. If we look at the S&P 500, again, this is the shorter term picture. You can see we're sort of on that rising 200 week moving average. Market's down 25.6% off the high. And importantly, we're sitting on support. Now, um, two weeks ago or a week ago, we had two very big days, Monday, Tuesday, where virtually everything was higher. Now, we work hard at trying to understand statistically where we sit, not based on how we feel or what we think the long run outcome in the economy may be, because we have to assist in trying to be tactical. You can be in a bear market like 2000 through 2003, but the fourth quarter of 2001 was a barn burner. And you might have left significant money on the table, not taking advantage of that lift. So Monday of last week was very strong and Tuesday even stronger. Now, statistically, I think it's important to look at this. On October the 4th, the S&P recorded 293 um, to one upside volume versus downside one. It's, it's important to understand how rare that is. If you take all the days in history where upside versus downside volume was greater than 100 to one, it's only happened five times. It happened back in uh, 1982. It happened in 2011. It happened in 2012, and it happened in 2018. All of them significant lows in a market that was very emotional and was sharply selling off. All of them wound up being important lows in the market. Now, we won't know until some time from now whether, in fact, it is an important low, but you can get important tactical lows. doesn't mean that you can't have difficulty later on but these were important lows. The last time the S&P gained 2% two days in a row, a different statistic coming off a 52 week low was November of 2008 and uh, September of 2008. Now that resulted in a significant rally into December 2008. That was a financial crisis. And in 2008, we saw blowout in the yields that bond investors demanded from corporate lenders, we're not seeing that right now. And then ultimately things rolled over and had one more move down into March of 2009. <clears throat> it does not appear at this point that there is anything that points to crisis, but it's not to say there can't be. But outside of that one occasion, there were a couple of other occasions, October 1990, October 2002, December 87, all of them really important lows in the market. 
But those are just statistics. That's not the way we make decisions. I think it's important though to understand quantitatively the underlying picture. Now let's look at the TSX for a second. TSX actually has very different timing than the S&P 500. The TSX went into a bear market in 2009 and underperformed the S&P 500 dramatically through until 2020. Well, why is that? Well, the TSX has a much larger weighting in energy and materials. It's actually closer associated to the commodity economies, has a much smaller technology weight, has this much smaller consumer discretionary weight, and has a much smaller weight in industrials. It's also interesting that it looks much more constructive than the S&P. So the TSX is not the S&P 500, and it may well be the TSX is the place to be. Just note that while the market bottomed in the S&P in the spring of 2003, it bottomed in the TSX midway through 2002. And in a period where the, the S&P 500 went nowhere from 2000. Uh, through 2013, the S&P, the TSX had a rip-roaring rally for six years while the S&P went almost nowhere. Again, pick your spots. So let's look at some indicators. Volatility, which is something we watch closely because we know when there's a lot of volatility, like 2009, volatility spikes. And that's the measure of what an option buyer has to pay as a premium to hedge against risk. You can see it really spiked. And it spiked in 2012, it spiked in 2015 during the Asian slowdown. It spiked in 2018, it spiked in the COVID low. And it's not to say that it won't, but at this point, we're not showing sort of broad-based panic or emotional markets. Now let's talk about the bond market. So the basis in the Equity market is we still are in a structural bull market until we are shown otherwise. Doesn't mean we're 100% invested in stocks. We're certainly not. We'll talk about that today. But there are certain parts of the market look really attractive. Let's talk about the bond market. <clears throat> We've lived our lives during falling interest rates from 1981 to the present. There were lots of fits and starts along the way. It didn't move in a one way direction. But clearly, we've seen a reversal in yield since 2020. We've reversed this long term trend. So maybe we have to go back and look at what happened in the 40s, 50s and for stocks at that time. I think it's really important. Now, we talked a little bit about this over the last few calls, and I want to talk about it again. This is inflation as you went through the 1950s and 60s. So going back to this picture, interest rates were rising in general through that period of time. So after the Second World War, you had an initial bout of inflation in 1947 and 48. And in those two years, there was a lot of new demand that was created as people came back from the war and new families were forming. The Fed had to rate, raise rates. And very quickly, the inflation came back out as supply chains got into order. After a brief recession and a shallow recession, <clears throat> inflation picked up again to 6%. Fed raised rates, inflation came right back down. In fact, all the way through the 50s and 60s, inflation had small bouts where it picked up, and it didn't pick up to stay until after 1965. So 15 years of an economy becoming stronger and stronger and inflation building into more of a trend. It was bouts, short-term bouts of inflation in the late 40s, early 50s. Let's look back at those long-term rates. We've lived in a world where every time there was a rate cycle, we would end up with an accident, 1987, uh, the, the savings and loan crisis, the tech bubble, the subprime crisis. This was rates were in a secular decline, but we're going against the grain from time to time. And every time we did, <clears throat> it choked off growth. We had a problem. In a reflating environment from the late 1940s through 1960s, we did have rising rates. There were no big financial crises. There were no big accidents because rates were naturally working their way higher in a reflating economy. But I understand why people assume that there will be a crisis during a rate hike cycle, because that's what we've lived through over the last 40 years. 
So if we look at industrial production through that period of time, it was rising in the late 40s, they raised rates, backed off a little for two years, inflation came out of the system. And industrial production grew from 1950 through 1953, rates hiked again after that second bout of inflation, a little pullback of industrial produ production, moved higher. And we just moved higher and higher and higher. Let's look at the S&P over that same period. Two big bouts of short-term inflation. Starting in 1949, the market just worked its way higher and it had little corrections, had no major crises. This is a reflating economy. We've been talking about reflation now for two years. And I'm not saying that Powell can't make an error by getting too tight too quickly. And the market does not like that. But it may well be that the economy is strong enough to manage it because we really have restarted a bunch of animal spirits in the economy. We'll see. So let's look at the bond market. We've had a reversal in the long-term rates. We bottomed in 2020 at virtually 0% interest rates, 1,000-year lows. We've certainly moved higher from there. <clears throat> We've been as high as 4% or 3.9 some odd today. We've talked, we talked about the fact that when we rise above a declining moving average, you often will pull back in, but the market sure hasn't liked this sharp move higher in yields. Looking at it on a shorter term basis, we started in 2020, and here we are now today up at 3.9%. We're above the highs from 2019. If we needed to prove that there had been a reversal in the direction of rates, we've done that again by reaching the highs from 2018. And the question is, how far do they go before we see a pullback? And I understand why bond investors care because the long end of the US bond market, the TLT, which is the 20 to 30 year bond ETF, is now down 44 and a half percent since 2020. I think most people know we've avoided bonds all the way along. It was an unusual thing to do but we stepped aside because our view was there was significant risk here. In fact, <clears throat> this year has been the fourth worst year since 1701. 1721, 1865, and 1920, all important structural shifts. And despite that, Bond investors continued to pile money into bonds because they felt that it was a good thing to buy the dips in the bond market after 40 years of buying dips. If you had a portfolio that was a 60-40 portfolio, as of the end of September, you were down 21%, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. That wasn't a good solution. If you were all in stocks, not so good. All in bonds, not so good tough place to be. <clears throat> now let's talk about another asset class, commodities. We have to recognize big shifts and we believe we went through a structural shift in 2020 where we went from a disinflationary world in commodities where after a long period of time of underperformance, companies just stopped investing in new capacity. Commodity prices turned in 2020 and worked their way higher. They've corrected a little over the last five months but looked very different than the stock market. The relative price performance of the basket of commodities, which is made up of agricultural commodities, metals, so on, had that strong relative performance versus the S&P since the beginning of the year and continues to. This could go on for a really long time. When we look at the history of commodity cycles, <clears throat> the Goldman Sachs Commodities Index total return divided by the S&P 500 or the relative performance goes in long swings of outperformance and underperformance, outperformance, underperformance, outperformance, underperformance. And we've only just started this shift higher in commodity prices. Now, the problem with commodities is <coughs> if you need more copper than you have in the world market, it may take 10 years to put a copper mine in place. So the fact that we've seen underinvestment in commodity production, agricultural and metals and so on, in a world where we're transitioning to electric cars and we need a lot more nickel and a lot more copper, perhaps a lot more aluminum, that may be a problem. It may be that prices stay firm for a long time. Looking at it another way, going back to 1800, again, very long cycles. And we've only just started this cycle. We're just through 
a 0% 10 year compounded return for commodities. By the time we're done, it'll be eight or 10 or 12% a year over 10 years. That's what it takes to put a lot of new production in place because people have the confidence to invest. So the RJI index <clears throat> over the last few weeks, while the stock market has been weak, has been very, very firm. And we're cognizant of the fact that it is an economically sensitive asset. But clearly, this is an asset class that's outperforming. It's up 19% on the year. If we break it down, oil is up 43% since the beginning of the year. Brent, Brent oil in Europe, especially strong. And the long-term picture is, it's been out of favor for a very long time. The energy sector as a part of the index went down 90% in the period into the spring of 2020 and has had positive returns since, but only just beginning a new bull market. That's what you get after 10 years of underinvestment, not enough capacity. So it probably means that it will be more resilient than other things. When we look at the point and figure chart for oil, over a long period of time, you had lower lows and lower highs. Until recently, we reversed, and then we've broken that downtrend. The same thing for energy stocks. Weak capital spending. <clears throat> if we go across the commodity producers index, the capital spending cycle adjusted for GDP is at about the lowest point it's been at since 2000. So it may not be that we get a lot of new capacity coming on anytime soon. It probably means that in a world of supply demand, this is something we might want to own, even if it wasn't what worked over the last 20 years. We're all more comfortable to own the things that we made money in over the last number of years. But if the world changes, that might not be the thing to do. Copper inventories are trading way below the range that they've been in from an inventory perspective going back over the last 10 years. There's no way around it. So base metals certainly pulled back as the stock market sold off, but have held in much better than the market and are trading above their long-term moving averages and really only began a new bull market <clears throat> in 2022. Same picture with gold, pulled back to the long-term moving average. This is a very long chart, it's back to 2011, but there's support here. The same with agricultural commodities, strong relative performance versus the S&P. So I would say that of the asset classes, equities, while they are tenuous, are still in a structural bull market. The bond market is clearly in a bear market and not the alternative to own more than short-term bonds. Commodities look as though they've made a significant turn and we can't ignore them as an asset class to be invested in. When we look at real estate, that's the thing people are most comfortable with and probably the thing that was most helped by falling interest rates. If you look at the REIT index, since the beginning of the year, it's down 35%. And that's because as rates go higher, the competition for return versus the cash that you can get from a portfolio of real estate loses its advantage. <clears throat> Six month treasury bill versus the cap rate on a portfolio of of commercial real estate, not much advantage for the risk that you take in an asset you have to continue to invest in. We know that the monthly returns in the residential real estate market have turned negative for the first time in a long time. And that's something that we have to keep in mind. So now let's talk about another asset class, cash. The US dollar has been exceedingly strong against all global currencies. And the reason for that is that U.S. interest rates have been much more aggressive in rising up to this point. But certainly now, central banks around the world are raising rates. The U.S. dollar versus the, current, the, versus the euro and the yen and the British pound has been appreciating sharply since June of 2021. It's now 17% above the long-term average. The last time we were in a situation like this, it got to 14% above the long-term average. <clears throat> but it's not impossible that it can be more. Back in 2002, in that rate cycle, we got to 22% above the long-term moving average. But the thing to keep in mind is along the way, there were significant corrections that took the pressure off. 
When we get a sharply moving uh, higher US dollar, it puts pressure on other countries like we've seen recently with the British pound. And when you get these pressure releases, <clears throat> it helps other assets to perform better. We don't know when that's gonna happen, but we do know it's moved higher relentlessly. And that's why there's concern about what it might mean for other asset classes. I will note <clears throat> that we put in a high in September and despite the fact that yields were rallying, US dollar has failed to make a new high at this point. And we're getting some negative divergences on the technical picture, which may mean that the steam is starting to run out a little bit or that we may see intervention globally. We know along the way that one of the big buyers of US dollars are people who are hedging a US dollar position. And when hedging momentum runs out, it tends to be when the dollar starts to run out of gas. And we've seen a little rollover in the activity of US dollar hedgers, which may mean we get some pressure coming off. So if we were to get a rally in equities seasonally, as we would tend to do from the middle of October, it may be that the pressure comes off interest rates, like the bond market, or comes off the US dollar, and that allows some relief in other assets. We'll have to wait and see. So what are the things driving the dollar? Well, it's been inflation and interest rates. And we know that the purchasing manager's prices index, or the prices paid by purchasing managers, has sharply started to come off. We need to watch for signs of a changing picture for inflation. We know that the cost to ship a container between the US and Asia has come down sharply, in fact, back to 2021 levels. We know that the prices paid data in the ISM index is very tightly correlated with what happens in CPI year over year, but it tends to lead. And CPI started to roll over. We'll see whether that continues. We have important CPI data later this week. But directly from JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon's bank, they highlighted in their strategy group that we that consumer price trends over the next 12 months look like they're starting to come off. U.S. expected inflation and consumer surveys look like they're starting to come off. The rent index looks like it's rolling over. Um, when we look at um, the uh, delivery times, delivery times are starting to come, come off. Container ships, um, container ships uh, at anchor starting to come off. World container pricing started to come off. And with headline CPI starting to come out, generally it leads core CPI, which is what the Fed is looking at. And then on the labor front, the number of US job openings has really started to fall. The, inflate, the, the employment data continues to be strong, but the job openings are starting to fall, which is what tends to happen when you get a slowdown. So if the Fed is trying to bring down inflation, there's a ton of data that shows inflation is starting to moderate. And if they're trying to cool labor inflation, then fewer job openings is the start of that process. The question is, how hard does the Fed want to push on rates when we are seeing the rollover that they expected to see? What I thought was really interesting was that <clears throat> this week's Barron's had the strong dollar on its cover. There's an old indicator that we always look for. It's called the Barron's indicator or the, or the front page indicator. By the time it hits the front page, very often you've hit the peak of the issue. So we'll see. Now we don't have to be everywhere. We have to take a portfolio where we have a mandate from a client and invest it in productive assets. <clears throat> we don't have to be everywhere. There are things that we want to avoid. There's things we want to focus on. Sometimes it's a broad list. Sometimes it's more narrow but we're trying to identify market leadership. We're trying to look for new leadership as it emerges in the absence of leadership, have an ability to be on the sidelines, either completely out of the market or large, out of large parts of the market. Our job is to be tactical. We use a combination of tools. We use our top-down tools to try and understand what the key themes are in the market. We try to identify specific securities to take advantage of those themes. And then we have a really disciplined selling strategy to make sure a little mistake doesn't turn into a big one. So if something isn't working out, we stop our way out. And it means that the portfolio is dynamic. We're always looking for areas of expanding breadth. And when we see contracting breadth, meaning fewer and fewer companies doing well, 
or securities in a specific area, it means we reduce our risk. We don't put any new positions on. And clearly there's been some of that over the last few weeks. Let's talk about leadership. As we sit, the breadth reading that we use for the US market, the percent of stocks and uptrends actually has expanded over the last two weeks. There are some very weak parts of the US market, but it's not everything. Some of our short-term indicators reversed higher and showed us some improvement as well. So if we take the NYSE, all the companies in the NYSE, we know we got to a point where only 18% of stocks were in uptrends. And that's pretty common with short-term lows or intermediate-term lows in the market. That reversed higher. As we sit today, it has come off about a half of 1%. It takes a 6% reversal to reverse it down. So it's solidly positive. The NASDAQ's a different story. The NASDAQ 100 briefly turned up and turned right back down again. This has been a weak part of the market over the last <clears throat> 12 months. From a sector perspective, there's a few sectors that meet our tests and that are positive, like energy, transports, apparel, steel, leisure, chemicals. These are pretty economically sensitive groups. That's where the improvement is. That doesn't really point to a hard landing, not in the near term. The technology sectors briefly turned higher and quickly turned back down again, software and semiconductors. We know that the market's pretty broadly sold out. So if we look at the NASDAQ 100, the NASDAQ 100 broke the old lows from June and is moving lower. This is a group that we want nothing to do. We have almost zero exposure in this sector. Let's talk about the leadership themes. <clears throat> Energy has been the big one for us. Again, this is relative price performance versus the S&P. We're above the long-term moving averages. This is the Canadian energy sector behaving very constructively. In fact, if you look at the US energy sector, it's been making higher highs over the last two years. And there's nothing to show that that's changing. Now we watch for risk that something's changing all the time, but we're heading out of the seasonally weak period for energy into the seasonally strong period. And there's no question there are supply demand imbalances globally. Some of the companies that we own continue to act really, really well. Tourmaline, Vermilion, and many others trading very near the Kais for the year. The, X, the energy index relative to the S&P, sorry, relative to technology, clearly turned higher a year ago and is probably in the early stages of outperformance for the next number of years. The capital investment <clears throat> in the energy industry at the end of the last bull market versus where we are now tells a totally different picture, which is why we're not seeing tons of new capacity coming on. The strategic reserve has been selling off about a million barrels a day to try and augment supply in the market, but they're now down to 22 days of supply for the U.S. market in the event that they needed it. There is a limit to how far they will go. My guess is it's going to be about the first week in November in and around the election period. But there is a clear supply demand imbalance and OPEC just cut by 2 million barrels a day. Energy infrastructure, the pipelines are behaving the same way. Very strong relative performance versus the market, and they pay us a great yield. So there's a reason why this is a big part of our portfolios. The financials. Now, the financials are a really economically sensitive group. If you thought there was going to be a hard landing in the economy, this is one that would be performing really poorly. But on a relative basis, continues to improve relative to the market and holding well above the June lows, despite all of the negativity in the market. The insurance sector is the same way. And we've got companies like Progressive, which are in property and casualty, that have highly consistent businesses that are performing exceedingly well. So by cherry picking within these groups, I think we've got some great holdings and ones that have done well against a very, very weak market. The long-term picture for the bank sector is that it rolled over in 2008. We've only just come out of a bear market. We pulled back to a rising moving average. The valuations are not expensive and the capitalizations are much, much better than they were going into the financial crisis where they were 40 times levered. 
Today, they're roughly 10 times levered. They could handle a lot of bad news. In the basic materials, the mining companies that produce metals and coal, again, relatively outperforming the market quite sharply. They're actually up 4% on the year. And from a supply demand standpoint, we know that markets are tight. If China's coming back online, that's going to only make things tighter. It's unlikely Xi will announce significant new stimulus until after he gets reelected, which will happen over the next month or so. And then likely you'll see some strong economic <clears throat> incentives uh, to, uh, to spend on infrastructure. We think this is very good risk reward. The healthcare sector. Well, the healthcare, sec healthcare sector is managed healthcare. United Healthcare is the biggest company. This is one of our largest holdings, is 10% of the index, trading at the long term moving average, only marginally off the highs holding in remarkably well. In the pharmaceutical group, Eli Lilly, which has a <clears throat> new drug for uh, Alzheimer's, which is markedly better than anything ever uh, on the market, trading near the highs. And the biotech sector, again, the sector itself behaving better than the S&P, but within the sectors, there's some stars. Vertex Pharmaceuticals, one of our largest holdings, trading very close to the high for the year. So there are some, part, some parts that are strong within the index, but they may not be where people are largely focused. Aerospace and defense obviously is a strong sector. Northrop Grumman <clears throat> performing really well. General Dynamics uh, and Lockheed Martin are all significant holdings for us. I don't think that there's any shortage of demand for uh, defense equipment going forward. Uh, and then also within, within the uh, industrials, waste management, is again a perform strong performing sector. This is Waste Connections. Sorry, it's uh, uh, ill marked. But Waste Connections, a Canadian company that provides uh, waste collection services and again, very predictable business. In the consumer staples, companies like Dollarama <clears throat> are obviously seeing people trade down from uh, more expensive retailers. Um, if for those of you that go to Costco, I'm sure that it's been busier than it has been in some time. Now let's talk about the weak parts of the market. This is the biggest part of the U.S. stock market. And it's understandable why the U.S. stock market is performing poorly. Apple's 18% of this index. Microsoft is 15% of this index. These are the biggest companies in the world. They're the ones that got to be the most expensive and the most broadly held. And they're the ones that are for sale. Relative price performance technology is very weak and doesn't show <clears throat> that it's turning anytime soon. And it's not to say that it can't bounce. But this is not a place that we want our investor money. And we've talked about the fact that we've been void of technology for months and months and months. Communications, the same picture, Facebook, Google, Netflix, and so on. Also weakness in real estate, which we talked about earlier, uh, and um, consumer discretionary, which were some of the biggest companies in the US. So there's a reason why the S&P is behaving poorly. When we look at our holdings overall as a firm, we're trying to do a couple of things. We don't want to be 0% weight because if we get a fourth quarter rally, which would be typical, even if it was a difficult market like 2008, we can't have no exposure. There's marked relative outperformance in energy, financials, and industrial, specifically defense. Consumer staples have been very stable and pay good dividends. We have a large cash weight, <clears throat> which is 6% cash, 27% short-term Canadian bonds, and some U.S. government bonds. And we have uh, some corporate bonds, which also support the portfolio. So that's roughly 35 36% across the firm, different for different portfolios. A market weight in materials, but we recognize it's more economically sensitive, so it's a small weight. And then virtually no technology, consumer discretionary, real estate, and very, very small communication services. We have a small weight in T-Mobile, which in fact is trading near the high for the year. So some stability in consumer staples, healthcare, and some inflation protection in energy, financials, and industrials. That's a barbell with a big cash weight in the middle that gives us flexibility to take step-by-step -step changes as they are needed going forward. So we can make a binary decision and sell everything, 
or we can be stubborn and pig-headed and stay invested and say, well, the market should rally at some point. Neither one of those are good solutions. We think that we need to be pragmatic about this and look at where we are. The market has pulled back roughly what it does in a typical recession. We're headed into the strongest seasonal time of the year. And it may well be that as in other Octobers, things resolve higher, at least in the short run. Now, if we go through, go across all of our portfolios and look at the weightings in our equity portfolio, roughly 27% cash and T-bills, 2% cash, you've got 25% T-bills and you've got a 40% weight in equities. In our balanced portfolio, 37% cash and T-bills, roughly 39% US equities, 22% <clears throat> Canadian equities. We have significant flexibility across all the portfolios. Now let's talk about the US market versus the Canadian market, because we've talked about the fact we've been largely focused in Canada for our equity exposure. The TSX is made up 30% financials, 18% energy, 13% industrials, and 12% materials. This is probably why the Canadian market is outperforming the S&P, which is made up largely of, if you do the weights, technology, communication services, consumer discretionary, very big parts of the market, and very small parts of the market make up energy, materials, uh, and financials. There's a reason why the TSX is outperforming. When we look at valuation, <clears throat> the PE of the energy industry is 10 times earnings. The PE for finance is 11 times earnings. The PE for materials is 12 times earnings. They already have relatively low valuations. So when we look at the TSX from 2002 through 2008, where the S&P underperformed, TSX was a very steady performer. Let's not caught up in thinking that everything is the S&P 500. Outside of the US, a couple of markets acting better. The, the uh, Japanese stock market, currency hedged, is trading near the highs for the year. Uh, Indonesia's acted better. Brazil, with its heavy energy weight, is trading way above the lows from June and well outperforming the S&P. And so in our macro portfolio, we have all of the inflation protection and a greater commodity exposure because it's a multi-asset portfolio. And I'm not just saying commodity producers, I'm saying actually the commodities themselves, which are very different than equities. We have a 15% short weight, the NASDAQ 100. We do have a new short weight, the US dollar, because we think that it's very extended and can roll over here. We have a 7% short weight in China and a specific three and a half short weight in technology and a 3% short weight in the mortgage market. Look, it's been a very difficult year to date. In 2022, <clears throat> the S&P 500 right now is down six, uh, 25%. Russell 2000 down 25, the NASDAQ's down 35% as we sit today. Globally, there's no relief here. In general, equities have been lower. The bond market has had its worst year, one of the four worst years since 1700. Commodities are solidly positive. Currencies against the US dollar have all been weak. So US dollar is the place to have some exposure. And Yields on basic uh, T-bills are almost non-existent and helps not at all with inflation. So we understand why people are bearish, but we have to pick our spots. We have some exposure to energy and materials which are behaving much better than other things. And we have no exposure to the weakest performing assets. We do believe we're still in a structural bull market. We'll figure that out over the next few months. If we were to break that 200 week moving average, well, it may be that we reduce more equities. But the thing to keep in mind is positioning is very, very light. Asset allocators exposure to global stocks is at an all time low. Hedge funds and asset managers are record net short US equity futures. Nobody's out over their skis with, it, with exposure. Retail option traders have gone crazy buying puts. Generally, is the crowd absolutely right at the right moment? 
Corporate insiders have stopped selling shares. They believe they're inexpensive. When we look at margin debt, margin debt when it's high tends to be a time when the market can roll over. When it's low, it means that people have repositioned their portfolios to be ready for the current environment. And we've seen an extreme low in margin debt. Sentiment is exceedingly bearish. And when we look at cyc cyclical exposure versus defensives, they're very, very inexpensive, meaning <clears throat> economic sensitivity has been discounted based on expectation of a slower economy. Now, a couple of details I want to just touch on. If you take the years where you had a really bad nine months for the Wilshire 5000, which is the US stock market, what happened over the next number of months? Broadly positive. And this includes some really tough years like 2008 and 1974. If you take seasonality, if you went back over time and put your money to work on May the 1st and took it out in October, this is going back to 1950, I believe. Sorry, 1961, you made no money. That's the seasonally weak period. If you put the money to work in, on October 31st and held it to May, you made virtually all of the returns of the S&P, but actually had less volatility than the S&P itself. So I recognize there's big issues that we're dealing with, but I think it's not lost on the market. And that's why it's down 25%. When we look at a presidential election cycle, it tends to be that the weakest point for the market in the year is in this month. And from here through the spring following, it tends to be that the market is exceedingly strong. Well, let's take every one of those election cycles from 1950 to the present. Every single one of them was positive between now and April. So it's not to say that things can't change, but it's important to understand as a portfolio manager and as an investor, what can happen and what is happening. It's not about how we feel about things. It may be that this is different than every other year in history. And that's why we have as much cash as we do and as targeted portfolios as we do. But the other option is just to sell everything and hope for the best. My guess is that it may be that this is different than every other year, but certainly you don't have the odds in your favor making that decision. So I can't tell you how many times I've had difficult conversations in the middle of October, and by the end of the year, the picture looks very, very different. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Jamie Dimon doesn't know what's going to happen. Even the Fed doesn't know what's going to happen. Only a few months ago, they said, we aren't even thinking about thinking about raising rates because we don't believe inflation is a problem. And when they realized that it was, they changed their stance. If they come to a view that they think they have tightened too quickly and they're causing a problem, they will change their stance. They won't be pig-headed about it. And it won't matter what they were saying the day before. The market will react to the new news and we have to be prepared for it. So we continue to watch credit risk. Credit risk is not showing up in the market. And if we need to get more defensive than we are already, we will because that's what we've done over time. So I hope if there's any questions I haven't answered, you'll call me with them or you'll raise them today on the call. But hopefully this is useful. I know it's a very difficult time. It's no fun at all coming to work right now. I can tell you that. But these things pass and we'll be on the other side of it at some point. Uh, and in the meantime, we just have to stay flexible and make decisions day by day. Pamela, are there any questions? We do have a few questions, Dave. The first one comes from John. He is uh, saying that, David, as you have said, it is difficult to decide when you are doing well in a sector. If we are going into a global recession, is it not appropriate to take some energy sector profits and buy back in during a recession when energy is valued lower? It's a good question. So um, again, we're assuming that like, like, um, like the, the recessions recently, oil pulls back sharply. And those pullbacks happened during a structural bear market in commodities. 
Um, if you went back to the last period of reflation, energy was not as volatile. So it may be that this is one where that takes place. And certainly, you know, we had in our equity portfolios, I think 27% in energy at the, at the biggest moment. And we have obviously way less than that now. And when I say energy, some of it is pure is oil exposure. Some of it's companies that produce oil and gas. But we do think that the odds are heavily skewed towards higher energy prices over the winter. Even Jamie Dimon doesn't think we'll see recession for six to nine months. And that's on the other side of the seasonal period of strength. So the US is gonna stop selling a million barrels a day out of their strategic reserves sometime over the next few weeks. We know that OPEC has just decided to cut their production by 2 million barrels a day. Russian oil is not coming back online anytime soon. So these companies are trading at valuations based on about $65 oil and oil is $90 a barrel. So we think that there's a very high odds of success here and we're paying very low valuations for these companies. And so <clears throat> what are the risks? Well, one of the risks of the market is that inflation is too sticky. Well, this is a sector that would benefit from that. If the economy really rolls over, we do have a very large cash weight that gives us flexibility to protect ourselves and to re-enter other things when they start to get better. So this isn't about all in or all out, um, but this continues to be by far the strongest part of the market. And you can certainly decide to take some exposure off, um, but we think that the catalysts are more positive than negative right now. So that's why we wanna have it, still have a, a substantial position. Thanks so much, David. The next question is a two-part question from Steve. He's asking first if you think that the Fed um, with raising rates uh, recently, do you think that they're raising them too aggressively and making the same mistake that they did back in 2008? And then the second part of that question, which we can always get back to, is the type of inflation that the Fed is trying to contain many commodities pulled back a lot. And, and another part of the inflation is due to supply chain disruption and rates have no effect on that um, based off of Steve's research and, and what he's read. So two parts, perhaps you could address those. Okay. So the first, the first one again, Pamela, because I got focused on the second, the first question was, uh, are they raising too quickly? Yeah, too quickly. I, I do think, I do think that Powell really fancies himself to be like Paul Volcker. And he is comparing the current situation to the early 1970s. And I would make the case that it took many, many years of bouts of inflation to entrench inflation in the system to become so difficult to knock it out. So I think it's more like the 19, early 1950s, late 1940s. <clears throat> At that time, governments had a lot of debt, so they held rates artificially low to, to suppress uh, rates and help them manage the debt lot like they've been in the last few years, less like the 1970s. Um, but he does fancy himself like Paul Volcker. Um, they have already tightened more than any other rate cycle this century. If you look at how much they've moved above the break-even rate for, for inflation. And so if they push it a lot further, then they will break something in the bond market. And that's why we spend so much time looking at credit spreads and bond market health for risks. Now, we don't own the bond market in general. We have some short-term bonds, one, two-year bonds, but not 10-year bonds, not 20-year bonds, not even five-year bonds. So we watch that for signs of for risks. Um, but again, part of what they're trying to do with their Fed speakers, 12 of them two days ago out in the marketplace telling us how tight they were going to be, is to try and use the bully pulpit to get us not to consume. So I think they can impact consumption and supply chain imbalances, and that's what they're doing. They're trying to give the system time to catch up and they can have big influence over that. I don't think they do have full control over commodity shortfalls because there's a, a, a structural imbalance. You know, China's been closed, yet, 
copper inventories are way below the 10 year range and there's no new production coming on. In fact, European smelters have been shutting down because energy costs are too high. So that's going to constrain supply as well. You know, agriculture, you can't fix a drought, you know, or you can't fix a war with interest rates. So that's why I think, despite being very vociferous about raising rates, commodity prices are outperforming every other asset class, even with these rate hikes. So um, I do think that there's a risk he's being too tight. I do think if there are cracks in the system, they will recognize it quickly, just like the Bank of England did last week when they saw that some of their pension funds were having trouble with derivatives. They very quickly put some liquidity into the system. And I think that if that were to take place, then, then you would see an about face by some of, the, some of the members of the Fed. But they're not going to tell you that until they actually do it, right? Until that moment, they are going to continue to say, we're ratcheting rates higher because they want to curtail consumption. Thanks so much, David. Well, that concludes the questions we've received this afternoon. So as always, I will leave you with the final word and thank you again for such a uh, thoughtful presentation. Hey, hey, listen, folks, I, I recognize, you know, when you read the newspaper and you watch the news and you listen to CNBC, <clears throat> it is a scary time for investors. It is a time when people feel emotional. Remember that a lot of the people who are talking a very bearish game or are talking their positioning in the market. Um, I, I, don't, I don't ignore the fact that there are risks and that's why we have a very big cash weight. And that's why we've been very quick to sell things that aren't working out. Um, and I think that fortunately we're, you know, we're doing, doing pretty well on a relative basis so far this year and have lots of opportunity when things get better to take advantage of them. Now, whether that is that it's a three or four month rally into year end, which could then roll over, or whether it's actually a real low in the market and it carries on for the next two to three years, we don't know the answer to that. But the difficulty is if we go sell everything to zero or worse, you decide to do that, then at what point are you gonna recognize that you should get reinvested? And it's not gonna be in the first 10 or 15% off the bottom. So, you know, going all to cash at a moment when the market's already down 25%, if you picked any moment in history, it might get worse for a couple of months, but then it gets better. And so uh, we have to see where things go from here, but we just, and we have to keep assessing it. Um, if you got questions, please call us and talk it through with us. Uh, and, uh, and if you're, you know, not happy where you are currently, you want to have a conversation, we're happy to jump on the phone with you at any point. The last thing is we're going to keep looking for assets that make sense for this environment. And we spent time over the last two years talking about this fund that we built to invest in music royalties. There's an asset that has nothing to do with the economy. It pays us about 7% month after month. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the economy. You know, that's another asset that's well suited for this environment. And we expect that to continue to do well too. So thanks everybody for tuning in and, uh, and uh, hit us up with questions via phone or, or email. And otherwise we'll talk to you again next week. Remember it's the middle of October. We're getting to the end of seasonality. We may have at least some pressure coming. Uh, let's see where things go from here. Thanks Pamela. Thanks so and much thanks. Dave. Bye-bye.